Stephen Kahn is a managing partner and broker in charge of Excel Real Estate Charleston. Today, I talk one-on-one -on -one with him about today's real estate industry for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Stephen Kahn, welcome to Quentin's Close-Ups. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. You're very welcome. I know that you are the managing partner and broker in charge of Excel Real Estate Charleston, which is a new brokerage here in the Low Country, and actually started in 2020. You are also an Air Force retiree, a husband and a father of three children. And I know that you moved here in 2009. When you think of Excel Charleston two years later, what is the biggest difference? Uh, I would probably say the impact. So the impact to the realtor community. Um, we foster a uh, collaboration over competition culture, uh, not just in our agency, but just in the industry alone and in our market, um, and not just in Charleston, I would say across the state. Uh, I also would say the education piece. I think uh, my team of agents are really the best agents in the nation. And, and, I would, and I say that with confidence because I built them up to a point where they are not just leading people astray or leading people in the wrong directions. We are doing the right things by the right people for the right reasons. What are you building within your particular agency? I want to say it's um, a culture of education, a culture of um, being able to share information without competition. It is a culture of integrity, commitment to excellence, um, and honestly being fearless about, uh, about the market. So the market is crazy, but we have some, you know, different techniques that we've been using to allow our clients to get into homes and win multiple offers. What is that competition right now in the real estate industry? Oh, that's a loaded question. So um, that, there's competition against agents, right? So agents have to compete against each other. Um, but there's competition in the buyer's market because there's a lack of inventory. So there's a complete shortage of inventory. Um, new home construction bills are significantly decreased over the last 10 years. Um, and so that puts us at a shortage where we, ha we have a pool of buyers, but not enough homes on the market. Uh, you know, we, we've been at the shortest level of our inventory probably in the last seven years for sure. Um, really kind of averaging right around a thousand um, homes in the, in the entire Charleston MLS, which is super crazy <laughs> because we're used to, you know, five, six thousand, seven thousand. So that just shows you from seven thousand homes, you know, even just five years ago to today with less than a thousand. And we're talking from zero to, you know, ten million dollars. Mm. Right. That's a significant difference which means that buyers have to be more prepared and more um, guided. They have to have the right education. They have to be, they have to have their pre-approval and ready to go. Um, and then they also have to have so many more savings that, you know, normally they wouldn't have to have. So that competition is, it's buyers against buyers trying to get that one home. You know, we have a, a house may hit the market today. It, Probably by Sunday, they're going to call for what they call highest and best because they've received multiple offers and now it's a bidding war. And so those, you know, that house may be in a prime location and probably receive 10 to 15 offers. So you have to come prepare and realize that, hey, I have to beat out 10 to 15 more people. I got to, <laughs> got to have my money right. I, and my agent has to be, um, knowledgeable. They have to have the relationships with the other agents as well, because, again, it's about competition. How do you prepare and educate your clients in this realm of real estate industry? I think we consistently do it through home buyer workshops. Um, we do a full buyer consultation with them and we go over literally everything. Hey, here's what a pre pre qualification versus a pre approval looks like. Here's what the home buying process looks like on paper and also practically. Um, we sit up, we, we show them the MLS, show them the numbers. Hey, here's what's, here's real life data. Here's what's really going on. And this is how we can, um, combat those things. So it's through education, uh, consistently. 
Um, we also do it through the resources that we send out. So even though we are awaiting, um, you know, their house to come up basically for them to show, we are educating them um, via email on the market update. So we're letting them know, hey, rates might have increased, right? What what will that do to your debt to income ratio? Um, and then we'll say, hey, we make want to make sure that you get back over to the lender to make sure you're even still in the right price range um, that we're looking at because things change literally daily. Um, there are so many, I would say, uh, again, the education piece um, mm -hmm. via email, the market updates. Um, and then we also are just super relation uh, relationship based. So keeping people inspired, keeping people motivated, uh, it is it is very stressful. The home buying process is, is is stressful. Um, I always tell people, you see all the closing videos and, and you know the, all the closing photos and all that stuff. Yeah. But honestly, it takes a long time to get there. So uh, please, if you see a realtor out there, please shake the hand, give them a hug, tell them <laughs> tell them tell them that you appreciate them because honestly, it it it, it has been tough. Um, but but I, I would tell you, our sale agents are tough. What is the biggest difference between savings 20 years ago to right now when you think of buying a home? Oh, savings. So probably 20 years ago, even just 10 years ago, um, there was a lot more assistance that sellers were able to uh, are willing to give uh, because it, it was more competitive from the, from the buyer side, right? They, there wasn't multiple offers at that time. So they were trying to say, hey, hey, come buy my house and I'll give you X amount in maybe to help with your closing costs. Today, sellers really aren't paying a lot, if any, closing costs at all, which means close and closing costs are, are basically all of your lender fees, all mm. of your attorney fees, mm. all of, you know, your prepaid, which are homeowners insurance and taxes to set up your escrow accounts. Those things could cost anywhere from, you know, two and a half to four percent of the purchase price. Um, if you are already having to put down an, on a loan product, let's say three and a half percent down, um, plus another, let's say another three percent down in closing costs. Now you're at six and a half percent of the purchase price. Um, normal five years ago, 10 years ago, that wasn't really the case. You could probably come with your down payment and that might've been it. Maybe an extra 500, you know, a thousand dollars here and there, but closing costs were a thing back then. Today, <laughs> it is very far and few between um, unless, you know, you go above purchase price in order to get those things back, which you're, which you're really not getting it back from the seller. You're really just financing it. So, for example, if you have a, a home came on the market at 250 and the seller didn't offer or is not offering to give you any closing cost assistance, let's say you go up to 255 and then now you ask them back for five thousand in closing costs. Well, in a in a sense, the net to them is still the two fifty that they're asking for. Um, but that cash, that five thousand dollar difference, is now being financed and it's not being brought from the buyer. So we are, you know, in a competitive market like this. This is one of the techniques that we use to try to get our buyers some closing cost assistance where they don't have to physically bring it to the table. Um, and then you know talk to a lender about refinancing maybe in a year or two, because that's really um, probably the most, most viable way to go. And what other techniques are on your table right now that you want to help out with your clients? Oh, um, honestly, just the, the impact piece of purchasing now. There is the, there's, the market is crazy. Yes. Have interest rates risen? Yes. Have prices risen in homes? Yes. But um, has the, the impact of purchasing a home changed? Absolutely not. Purchasing a home allows you to build equity and, appreciate, and the house appreciates. We are so used to um, purchasing cars that depreciate or, you know, or, or just or being a renter, right? Where you're paying someone else's mortgage or in the commercial world, you're paying down their commercial mortgage, right? And never getting the chance to experience what appreciation and value equity in a home can do for you. Um, you know, let's say, for example, I have some clients that uh, closed just one year ago, now have over 
$50,000 appreciated in their, in their home, $50,000 mm-hmm. for just paying their mortgage on time, for just living in their home. Doing the very things that they normally would do prior to that one year that they purchased. Now, did it take some sacrifice to get in that home? Absolutely. They had to save. They had to save a little more. They didn't get any closing cost assistance, right? Yeah. And But they understood the impact of what that would mean later. So that's $50,000 in one year. And that's just one example. Now, every every market or every subdivision, you know, may not appreciate that that rapidly. However, what if... Next year, they go to refinance, and now they're at 100000 And they are able to take maybe $75,000 from that 100000 because the, the banks won't allow you to pull out all your equity. But let's say they take out $75,000. What can that $75,000 do for them? Who, who knows? They could have debt that... You know, that have that that has accumulated for so much, so many years, so much time. They could want to renovate their home. They could want to pay off a car, pay off some other debt that they might have gotten into from the home. That and they're just borrowing from themselves. Mm. From their from their own from their own home. And that is one thing that is so powerful. And it's not to say that you have to per- have to borrow from yourself because you don't. You can just let, allow that to continue to increase. Right, that equity continue to go up, and and what that shows is assets. So it's a mind shift thing that takes you from, you know, not only am I just paying something to to pay it off, I'm paying something down, and it's also paying me back. Mm-hmm. That's the type of education and and type of knowledge that we need to understand is that what can this sacrifice make me in the end. How, what, what is it going to do for me a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? What's going to happen when you say, I, you know what? I don't like this house as much as I thought I did. I want to purchase another house. Well, maybe now I can upgrade and use the equity that I built from my starter home or, or maybe, you know, just the first home. Now I can put that same money or just a portion of it into my next home. And that's, and, and when you start to, I, I always tell people, Generational wealth doesn't start with just buying a home, right? It's, it's about what you do with the equity after that. So now if I have $100,000 and I'm selling my home, and now it's what do I do with that $100,000? Where do I invest it in? Who do I give it to? Where, where does it go? Where do I, where, what vehicle do I use to make sure that it stays in a, in a trust or in an IRA so that it continues to build? Right. And that's the piece that creates the generational wealth. So I, I would absolutely say that, you know, I, I, I kind of forgot the question now because I, I get so excited about. Yes, sir. <laughs> stuff like this, because, man, impact is so key in real estate. And, and it is one. I always tell people it's just one vehicle to generational wealth. It is not everything, but it's it's one of the fastest ways. And I can't tell you a millionaire or billionaire I know that does not have a real estate portfolio or has not purchased real estate at all. Even if you don't, um, even if your goal isn't to have, a, you know, an investment portfolio, purchasing your own home, having that sense of, you know, home ownership and just knowing that you own a piece of the American dream is is really beyond beyond belief, man. I get excited about every homeowner I see. Uh, we We've served so many families over the last two years. Um, I believe just over about 530 um, homes over the last two years or family served. And man, that just does my heart so good. Yes, yes, indeed. What are other hidden pieces when it comes to generational wealth? Ooh, hidden pieces. So I think, honestly, I, I really think it starts with, it starts with you and your mindset. It starts with you getting out of your own head that you don't deserve, right? You, we look at people and say, you know, oh, I wish I had that or, uh, you know, one day maybe, right? But that one day could be today. It's really when you say to yourself that, you know what? I deserve it. I'm going to connect myself with the right people so that I can learn and get the education I need to make it happen. That. When you can accomplish that piece, it changes everything. It changes the directory. 
because now your appetite has changed. See, you have an appetite for certain things. Everybody has an appetite for certain things. But when you have an appetite for growth and knowledge and wealth, your connections change. Your mindset change. Your heart changes. What you do changes. The people that you're around changes. And you get to that point and you say, you know what? Now I need to go sit down and talk to a financial advisor. I need to go. You know what? I think maybe I do need an accountant. Maybe I do need a CPA. Maybe I don't need to do my own taxes. Maybe there is somebody smarter than me in those areas. And those are the people I need to be around, right? Because again, every millionaire, every, every wealthy person I know has these people in their lives. And not only do they have them, they continue that relationship. It's not that they just go and make the one, you know, make the one sit down. No, they make the one sit down and then they follow up. They actually do what these experts tell them to do, right? And this is, and, 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 and with that, I think it's so key to make sure that we don't just go with the first thing we hear. Just because it's successful for somebody else doesn't mean it's going to be successful for you, right? So you also got to go with something that you're comfortable with and that you're also going to be consistent with. Because if you're not consistent, if you're not going to be consistent with it, it's going to be a waste. It's going to be a wash. It's going to be a waste of your time, a waste of their time. You're not going to get the results that you want. And then you're going to say that it was a failure, right? Then it's going to allow you to go back in your mind and say, you know what? Maybe that wasn't for me. Maybe I don't deserve it because it's too hard. But no, it's not hard. You just didn't, you just wasn't following the right path. You just didn't ask enough people. You just didn't go to enough di different resources. You didn't get what you really needed and you wasn't comfortable. So you didn't, you wasn't consistent. That's the piece. That's one of the hidden gems. The other hidden gem I would say is having multiple, you, you know, we always hear about having multiple streams of income, right? Mm -hmm. Seven streams of income. And, and I'm all for multiple streams of income, but make sure those multiple streams again are something that you actually enjoy or mm -hmm. actually can commit to for long term because wealth generational wealth is not built overnight it takes time the, the first word in that is generational which means it's a whole generation that has to go it has to go through for it to really start to to progress and not only that piece it's the people have to have the mindset passed down as well the people have to have the ethics passed down as well. The people have to have the characteristics and all those things to keep those things going, that generational wealth going. They all have to have it. So we have to start teaching our people, hey, even though I, I know it gets rough, it might seem, seem rough right now financially, you don't have to go to the title loan place and get a, get a title loan on your vehicle, right? You don't have to go get a payday loan. You don't have to do these things, right? You, you don't have to push yourself down in more debt because you're in a tight strain right now, right? There's other resources, there's other people. And those are the things that we have to start sharing. Hey, you know what? There's some assistance out there. I know COVID, you know, really hit a lot of people a lot really hard. And there's some people still suffering from that. But at the same time, there were so many resources that was available to, to help, right? And we should share these, share these things, share these ideas. And say, you know what? Hey, here's here's where you can go to get that help. Don't go, don't go title your car that you paid off, you know, at just for five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, and now you may have to pay them five thousand dollars to get it back. That that's what's killing us, and that's what and that type of mindset is is what kills us, and I believe is one of the barriers for generational wealth. Um, one of the other hidden things I, I would say, lastly, is really. Um, I, I believe that generational wealth starts with generational health mm. and not just physically, but mentally, financially. Right. And so that generational health piece has to be key because that's what's going to keep you going. If you're you can make all the money in the world, but if you're not healthy on the inside, you're not going to be able to take care of it. Right. You're not going to be able to enjoy it. You won't be able to enjoy that house that you bought if you're not healthy mentally, right? We got to start. It's okay to go see a therapist. It's okay to go get an annual physical. It's okay to go 
you know, to, to go to the dentist annually, get your teeth cleaned six, every, you know, every six months. It's okay to do these things, but we see it. See, sometimes we see these things as, as liabilities because we have to pay for it or because, you know, our insurance has to pay a portion of it and we might have a copay, right? We don't, it's not a consistent thing because we don't think we need it, but you don't really know what your body needs sometimes, right? And so I think we got to get to the point where we start focusing on taking care of ourselves, educating ourselves. What are we feeding ourselves? What do, what daily, what are you listening to? What are you reading? That's going to make sure that you get to that goal, right? What's the, what, what are you doing daily? That's going to, and I call them IPAs, income producing assets. What, and not just financially, but mentally, what are you doing? That's going to produce what that's going to produce income. That's going to feed my soul, you know, and provide income to that. What's going to feed me? What's going to feed my table and what's going to feed my health? Those are the things that we got to start thinking about. And those are the things that's going to help us really get to generational wealth. You know, we got to start thinking about, you know, and stop thinking that the stock market is not for us, right? It is. There's ways to invest. There's ways to invest in the stock market. There's ways to invest in real estate. There's ways to invest in, in our health, right? Daily exercise. And that's something that it's just a mental thing. A, a lot of people don't stick with it because it's a mental thing. You have the you have the conscience to say either I am or I won't. And we and see the enemy knows how to get us. And, and I'll say sometimes it's not always the enemy. Sometimes it's the inner me, which is your inside, right? The inner me. The inner me says I don't feel like going to the gym today, so I don't go to the gym today. It's not an enemy that's out there getting you to not go to the gym. It's you, right? And so I think that piece, um, along with, again, the education, the diversification of, of generational wealth, because it's not just through real estate. You know, you need seven multiple streams, right? So some different things, different ideas. And, and I also would say, um, lastly, to just find something you're good at and just do it. Like, it, something that you're good at, that you love to do, that, and maybe you don't even know it right now because a lot of people are, are pushed into places, but they're pushed into places because they were connected to somebody at the right place at the right time, which also means that you have to get out. You got to get out of your comfort zone, right? You got to start networking. And then once you meet these people and, and, and God aligns you, you'll know that's where you were supposed to be. That's when you'll get to your generational work. What was your comfort zone before you became a big, rea or, you know, obviously real estate star here in Charleston? I think my comfort zone was, so I was in the military for eight years and then I served civil service um, for six years. Huh. And I want and honestly, that was my comfort zone. My comfort zone was serving the nation. And, and in my mind, I was giving back to my country, um, even on the civil service side, because I was responsible for so much. Um, and so much impact of over, uh, overseas, you know, and abroad, I felt like that was, and it was something that was second nature to me, right? It was something that I, I like to do, but then I got to a point where I realized that it wasn't enough. I wasn't reaching enough people. There wasn't enough, um, and the military is large now. You're talking, <laughs> talking three, just 360,000 in the Air Force, right? So we, the military is large, but, but I said, I'm not being fed daily by what I'm giving. I'm giving, 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 but I'm not being fed. And it took a while to understand what that really meant for me and what I needed to be fulfilled. But I, I and I, I went back to school. I said, you know what? Maybe I should just go get another degree. I went and got my master's degree. I said, you know what? Uh, you know, this isn't it. <laughs> this isn't it either. Um, uh, I was like, okay, you know, maybe it's another promotion. I got uh, applied, got a, got a promotion. So, you know what? That's not it either. Um, but what I found was when I got my real estate license and I started to see how people's lives changed when they got those keys, that, that first year that they had Thanksgiving in their home and Christmas in their home, that single mother that fought so hard to get her credit up 
and didn't have the opportunity. And, you know, her mom and dad didn't have the opportunity to purchase before, but she was their first one in their generation, right? That, that was able to purchase a home. And no, it probably wasn't the biggest home, right? But it was hers. That, when you can make somebody understand and believe in themselves, that is what changed the trajectory of my life. That is what got me to the point that I am today is because I love to serve. Serving is a, is a key. It's, it's really key to, I always say, you know, I'm a servant leader. I, I, I put the people's needs first. Um, but at the same time, uh, what I saw was it's not just the clients, it's the agents that need to be served as well. And so that's what kind of got me to the broker broker side of it was that I just want to feed into the agents. I just want to show agents that you can too, right? Yes, I was a top producer, did you know, did my own personal deals, but it's not about me anymore. It's about you. I I don't want to get to the top and just stay there. I want to bring so many more people with me, right? So it's not about what I did. It's about who I'm bringing up. And guess what? I have about over 90 agents now, just in the last two years. That, and yes, that face, you absolutely correct. <laughs> it's an insane number. Every time I tell people, it's an insane number. But honestly, I know them all. Like, I know all of my agents. I talk to all of my agents. We all have a great relationship. It's about, it's, we, are, we are a big family. But they, they know, they trust, and they understand that I'm going to lead them in the right way. And I, and I feed so much back into them. You know, I, I am, I'm a national real estate coach as well, um, with a company called Club Wealth. It's an amazing company. And I get to not only impart in agents here in Charleston, but nationally. So when I can, oh man, it, it fills me, it fills me up so much because it's some agents that if they didn't have the right leadership and guidance, they would not be where they are today. Mm. They would not be able to provide for their families today because they they were in a place where they weren't being fed. This is something that I do differently at my brokerage is where it's not just about transaction base. I'm here to feed you mentally, yeah. here to motivate you, inspire you, right? Here to speak to that inner you and get you to believe in yourself because if you can't be here for yourself, you can't be here for our clients. And then if you can't be here for our clients, our clients are not going to get the impact that I need them to get in home ownership. Then they won't be able to show their kids generational wealth and so on and so forth. So it starts with that agent being able to believe in themselves. That's where I believe, that's why I believe I'm where I am today. We're followers, and of course, you're a father and husband. Who's feeding into your soul? Oh, another load of question. Um, man, I'll tell you, my wife does a lot. People don't see her as much, but she is really the one that's kind of in the background, just making things happen. Um, you know, I can pick up the phone. I use, I can have a bad day, call her. Like she will tell, say the things that I need her to say at the right moment. So um, shout out to my wife, Rachel Khan. She's um, amazing. Uh, but she she's one, obviously. Um, I do have a, a coach at Club Wolf as well um, that kind of helps me on the real estate piece. Um, man, my pastor, Pastor Isaac Holt, a Royal Missionary Baptist Church, um, one of the greatest church here, I, I believe. He He's amazing. And, and I always say, you know, his support over the last two years has really been uh, what I needed, I believe. And, you know, to have the support in the faith-based community in Charleston um, means a lot. Um, he, he, he's one, again, my coach, uh, my real estate national coach, uh, I, I, I like to say and the other people, and, and I kind of put them all in one, um, is really my Excel family. Like, my, listen, the Candace and Kenny McEwen, they're the founders and owners of, in, in Columbia of Excel Real Estate. And man, our, our whole leadership team, we are just, we, we feed into each other weekly, daily. Um, so we do these daily morning huddles every morning, Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. And although I lead, although I lead most of them, 
I get so much out of it because I'm not only talking and, you know, trying to inspire and motivate other people. I'm doing it for myself. So um, my, my cell family, they give, I, I always say I give a lot, but they give back to me. Um, they always take care of me. They always, you know, they're always texting, calling, making sure I'm okay. Um, stuff like that is needed for a leader because, you know, you got to know that you're appreciate certain things are appreciated uh, because we do so much in the background that, you know, people don't really understand. I know or even know what's going on. Uh, but it's good that it's good to be fed back and just say, you know what? Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, I, I go on social media all the time and I see people, I, I see people on social media and then I'll see them out somewhere and they'll say, Oh man, you, you're, thank you. Like, thank you. And, and to me, that, that's what feeds my soul. That's what makes me say, you know what? I'm doing the right thing. Yes, indeed. And let me go back to obviously real estate because, you know, you talk about sales all day long in your career. What were your sales in 2021? 2021, um, brokerage, we were 390 families. I believe we were at 97 million in sales, um, which was insane for a, a smaller. And I, I always say our brokerage is composed of brand new agents within the last three years. So um, to take a brand new agent and make, you know, that amount of sales in, in 12 months was insane. But um, yes, three. Right, just over three ninety. I think it's about three ninety six uh, families and um, fifty. Oh, oh, well, over ninety seven million in production was twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty two, our goal um, is five hundred families and um, one hundred fifty million. So we are we are right on track. Um, I looked at the numbers. I want to say it last week we were just over about one hundred and ten families already, um, and about uh, about. 30, 30 million or so. So we are right on track to, to hit that 500, 150 million. So um, I believe that with, with the agents doing what they're currently doing, but they're also just, just naturally growing, just naturally imparting into them. Um, and, I, and I hope the market, <laughs> the market continues to help us with that. Um, but, but we'll definitely, we'll definitely achieve it. And speaking of which, what was the median price for a home in 2021? Oh, in 2021, so we're about 360 ish um, per se. But I'll tell you right now, our um, our median sales price in the whole Charleston market um, is 385. Wow. So um, you know it's increased a little. Um, Charleston County obviously is the highest. Um, Charleston County right now is about 510. It's about 509. Mm -hmm. um, Berkeley County is about 365. And Dorchester County is about three, three forty-five, somewhere in there. Um, I looked at the numbers yesterday, actually. There's some obviously we have to keep up with, but uh, but yeah, we're about three eighty-five now in the Charleston market. So that means that you know people that bought two years ago, three years ago, it's a completely different time. <laughs> it's a completely different time. You know, there's it, finding a four-bedroom house, two and a half baths for two hundred thousand or two fifty is not happening. Um, it is not happening at all. So, um, I, I that's, again, knowledge is key. So if we educate and let people know this up front, they can be better prepared um, to, to experience that impact. Now, how many new home sales were there in the Tri-County in 2021? In 2021, I want to say we were around, matter of fact, I actually have that data for you. Ooh. And I believe... It was we are yearly twenty three thousand. Wow, <laughs> twenty three thousand. So, um, which is a lot. <laughs> yes. uh, and, and again, we were just a, a small piece of that, but um, twenty three twenty three thousand, which kind of which which really puts it into perspective that we have so many people coming um, to Charleston. But it's also to say. Now that's twenty three thousand that actually went into homes. Probably had at least that amount, if not more, go straight into you know apartment complexes. If you haven't paid attention, as apartments going up everywhere, um, and it's really and it's a good thing because it does help our you know the growth that we do have here in Charleston. It does help our housing uh, crisis 
um, in a sense, because it gives people a place to come now, right? Um, and not, even though they don't have a place to purchase yet, it yeah. gives them a place to be here and to experience Charleston. So renting is not, you know, it's not horrible. It's not bad. It's mm -hmm. just that, you know, to get to a point where you use renting as a vehicle to get to home ownership. It's not something to just stay in forever, right? Um, you just use it as a vehicle until until you're ready uh, to purchase. And in the Tri County, Stephen, what area saw the largest home price gains in the fourth quarter of 2021? Uh, fourth quarter, I honestly would say um, Berkeley County. So Berkeley County, and the reason is because Berkeley County is um, does contain you know cane bay and nexton and that somerville area is very it's crazy <laughs> it's crazy uh but yeah it, it has to be berkeley county man there's so much growth going up in that area um and they they have really um not just the home sale price the home prices or, or the homes that's going up on that side is really the commercial the commercial aspect of it too the commercial development is so key in um in what we do here and i th obviously you have to have places where people can go right that's why people are attracted to you know people are attracted to certain areas because of what's around it where can they go to eat what can they go to eat it's things like that um so berkeley county i believe was about um somewhere around 20 uh 20 percent uh, increase um because our entire our entire mls was about 14 percent um, and Berkeley County was right there, um, around 20%. I want to say Charleston is about, um, 19% ish. So right under that, but, um, uh, Berkeley County is definitely, definitely the, the, the biggest hitter, I would say. And, and where in the tri County did you exactly see a double digit, uh, price rise? <sighs> the, now the double digit price rise was absolutely in Charleston County. Mm. So Charleston County, because of Mount Pleasant. Yes. So, and that that's really it. Um, if we was to take Mount Pleasant out, I, Charleston County would be completely different. Um, but it does it does host a lot uh, host a lot of it. But um, that was definitely Mount Pleasant. Now, don't get me wrong, Dorchester County is not very far along, <laughs> very far from it. Yeah. Um, they are really around like neck and neck now. It yeah. used to be, and, and, and just to put this into perspective, so um, probably five years ago, so about seventeen. Um, Prices used to increase about six to seven percent a year. Mm. We are now talking twenty percent, fourteen to twenty percent year. So you, we are now double that, almost triple that in some certain cases, um, in, in sales prices a year over year. That again, tell, that tells you what that does to equity. Appreciates like crazy, yeah. um, and so. If, if people are on the fence about what should they do, the time is now because, you know, the, the increase is, is at least double or triple the, the amount. So it, it's definitely, um, it's definitely something, but those double digits that Charleston County took it, but don't test the county, Berkeley County is not, not far behind at all. And then, uh, the areas that were once quiet now, like Jedburg, Holly Hill, St. George, those are getting increasing as far as, for, as far as growth too. So. They are Rid Ridgeville. Ridgeville yes. is another area that that's growing. Um, you know, Holly Hill. I think they're getting the, the Walmart out there. It's, uh -huh. it's so it's a lot that's going on in our you know in our suburb. What we used to call maybe country or area right. that are now developed. Um, <laughs> if you think about just think about Somerville exit one ninety four that Jetbury exit. Yes. Five six six years ago it was not like that. Eight years ago it was not like it is now. Now it looks like a, a almost getting off on main street right <laughs> on, at 199 it's almost the same like they're developing so much around it um and, and and it's just so good to see it's just so good to see that charleston is increasing the the port is is booming the you know our our other um uh, boeing is booming bubbles booming mercedes booming you know and bringing all of these great great people to our area um feeding back into our community that it's just so really, really good to see. And you talked earlier about COVID and how it has affected a lot of people's lives. How much has um, interest rates rate that is hovered around this area because of COVID? So um, 
so initially when COVID happened, mm. um, interest rates were somewhere around like three and a half to maybe four. So with all the government assistance, interest rates actually went down. So they were around, like, you could get an interest rate like two and a half to three in the two. So, mm. and, and just a history of interest rate. Interest rates have not ever been two. And for, like, we talking a hundred years, okay? So nobody in this generation has ever seen two, two point anything. Wow. Um, but we were in that for about, for about a year. So about, I would say August to maybe last August, um, we were somewhere around that twos, maybe like maybe low threes. Um, but today, interest rates are normally four plus. Um, you may get something around three and a half to four um, if you have. But there are there are some high credit score clients that are getting four or five, even close to five in the five percent range. Um, so it has increased from what from what COVID did, but it's still normal for where we were prior to. Because in 2017, 2018, rates were between four and five. It was it was fine. There was no, you know, so I, I tell people, yes, interest rates, they rose from from a, a, a bottom state. Like kind of like <laughs> where where we never was at, ever before. Yeah. They, yeah, they but they've just normalized. Right. So I tell people they, they haven't, you know, they haven't really wrote. They just normalized. They just got back to where they were. Um, right. So it, it's still the right time to purchase because if they increase anymore, there's certain people that may not be able to qualify you. Wow. Because of the rise in the interest rate. If you think about it, you know, it, a, a, a point, so from 3.5 to 4.5 really can change somebody's payment to about $140, $150. That increase in payment could really take somebody out of the ball game, right? Or it will decrease their purchase power, their buying power, right? So instead of being able to purchase 300,000, now they're only able to purchase 275 or less. And there's a big difference between a house that's 275 and 300. Even though it's $25,000, there's a big difference in the market. And, and, you know, and what we have to do now, again, we have to go over list price probably to even get the per get the house. So that, that's a big difference. So I, I always tell people, you know, shop, shop your rate. First off, make sure you go to a couple different lenders because lenders have different incentives and lend lenders have different things that they are able to do. Um, it's all based on the, the whole person um, credit file, I would say, um, and the whole, whole concept. So it's not just income. It's not just credit. It's credit, income, and assets. So if people have some savings, they may be able to reduce that interest rate, or they may be able to purchase, buy down that interest rate as well um, in order to help you know, increase their buying power. And I'm glad you mentioned that, Stephen, because I wanted to ask you, how much has home buying power increased by over the past two years? <laughs> wow. So increased, I would definitely say um, it, it's increased a, a, a great bit because there are people that, you know, are at that 280 to 300 level or maybe even 325. And I'll tell you probably, um, even just probably four years ago, mm -hmm. if, a, if a realtor was to get a $300,000 approval, it was like, yes, <laughs> we, we are winning. Uh, today, 280 to 300 is kind of average. It's, mm -hmm. it, and it, it, it sounds, it sounds bad in, in certain ways because it's like, wow, like, that is really a lot of money, but just in this market where the prices are, it's really not. So buying, buying power has, it, it's only, in, and I would say it's only increased a little bit, but it's really been because of the lower interest rates. Now we're seeing things normalize, right? And, and, the re and let me take that back. So the reason is, so if you, you can have a higher price point if you have a lower interest rate because the payment is now lower. Right, the debt to income ratio is not lower, but now the interest rate has risen back or normalized, right? But the prices are still the same and or increasing. Now the buying power is much shorter, much much smaller, because you don't have that much room to play. Yeah, we don't we don't have you, you know your your pay your gross income is your gross income. 
the numbers are the numbers. They're not, <laughs> we can't make it work, right? So um, that's the piece I think, I think over the last two years it's increased significantly because of the lower interest rate, but now it's starting to normalize and now some buyers are not able to compete anymore because of that same reason. Mm. There's another question I wanted to ask. Has the supply of existing homes dropped? Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So again, you know, existing homes, we were, you know, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 easy. And, you know, now we're at, you know, 900 or so. Um, actually, I, I wanted to bring, bring that up. So just today, we have 1,143 homes. 1,143 homes. Oh. And that, that, that's single family, that's townhomes, yeah. that's attached and detached, that's mobile homes, that's everything, right? So we're talking from, again, from let's say 7,000 to, to 1,000, 1,100, that includes new, some new construction. Now, some new construction is not in here, but, you know, even if it was 1,200, yes, that is significantly decreased. Wow. Is there a high demand and a, obviously a low supply of houses? A high demand and low supply, absolutely. There's a complete high demand. I'll tell you, so one, one of my top producers uh, texted me a couple of days ago. She said, um, I got six buyers and there's no houses. <laughs> there's no houses. So we, and she's not the only one because there are so many other agents that have probably five to 10 buyers just waiting, mm -hmm. just waiting on the right house to pop up. Mm -hmm. Just what, just, and so, I, to and on the listing side, I try to prep them and say, "Listen, there are going to be so many people coming through your house in the next, two, you know, the first day, the second day that we put this on the market, because there's a pool of buyers out there that are just waiting. Sometimes, you know, sometimes listings come up, and they may be the only one in the neighborhood. Imagine that type of, you know, pressure, right? <laughs> But imagine that, imagine what that does. So it obviously it increases the demand for that house because now you got at least probably 30 qualified. I mean, we talking pre-approved, ready to go, yes. right? And some of these are cash buyers and which, which does help. Um, but some of them are ready to go. So absolutely the high, the, it's a complete high demand. Um, and this lower inventory is, is really something. And one thing I want to add on that, I yes, mentioned sir. cash buyers. We have, buyers just need to be aware, and it's something that we always talk about, but there are some companies like corporations that are coming into our area and they are purchasing these single family homes, probably under 350 or so. They are purchasing these homes, cash, no appraisal contingency, so they don't even care if it appraises at, what it, at the contract value. They are coming over asking price and it is putting our, um, our clients that may be upgraded, maybe, you know, from Charleston, maybe trying to upgrade to another property or, you know, just uh, people that may have gotten here two years ago, three years ago, that's now ready to purchase a home. It has put them at such a disadvantage because they can't compete with a cash offer that's 10, 15 grand over with no appraisal contingency, meaning that it doesn't even have to appraise for, for that, right? They can't compete with that. Mm -hmm. And so these corporations are coming in and it's something that, you know, I just hope that sellers really understand what that means because these corporations are coming in, purchasing all of these homes. And I'm not talking just one here, one there. They are by the dozens. They are, and they can close fast because they have cash, right? They are closing pretty quickly. If it's enticing to a seller, they, and, and what they are doing is renting that same house back to another family. Mm -hmm. But they're not giving a pre-approved buyer the opportunity to experience home ownership. Mm -hmm. That's impact, right? That's the piece that we, we got to start educating our sellers about. We are, I always talk about buyers so much, but sellers need to understand that when you're selling in this market, hey, what are you leaving behind? What are you doing for the next person, right? That's just as key as selling the house. 
It is. And how many cash buyers were there in 2021? Cash buy so probably out of that twenty three thousand, I mean we're looking at at least probably um probably about seven to eight thousand. But but in that same thing, even though but that was an increase though. Right. Because cash buyers usually are I mean maybe two, three thousand, you know, a year, but it increased because of those corporations. So, you know, they they have and they'll show proof of funds, so it's something, you know. If somebody wants to pay cash, they always have to have their proof of funds. Um, and they're showing, you know, twelve million dollars on the two hundred thousand dollar home or three hundred thousand dollar home. So they have the liquidity to, you know, to basically purchase pretty much probably ten homes a week. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, that's exactly what was happening. So this probably started around um, right in about twenty twenty, right when COVID hit. Um, and I think that's when my people's mindsets changed, right? Everybody was like, oh, what do we do, right? And what did they do? Invest in real estate. You know why? Because they know the value of appreciation. So if corporations know it, we should know it too. We should take advantage of the exact same things that they are, right? They know that if they come and purchase in Charleston, they're going to get not only Six percent that we were getting five years ago, they're going to get fourteen and twenty percent on their investment. That is the key to generational wealth. That's it. And with the surging res residential real estate market, what group of consumers has actually made it increasingly difficult to actually achieve home ownership? <sighs> um, a gr the group of individuals I would say is that is that corporation piece, but then mm. also. Um, and, and not just corporations. I would just say investors in general. Oh, yes. You have people, you have investors that are in California, um, New York, New Jersey, investors from all over that are looking in Charleston because Charleston is not only, um, you know, one of the top cities in the tourist state, right? But it's also really good for investors because investors really started getting into Airbnb. Mm. So investors are like, hey, I can purchase a home here and get 14 to 20 percent on my investment and I can cash flow with Airbnb. Why would I not do that? Right. So that is those are and, and what they're doing. Again, investors usually have cash. Right. And even if they don't, they have their 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 financing together. They're ready to go. And sellers are willing to sell to them because. They are ready to go and they can close as fastly as possible. And, you know, usually they don't have any hiccups. They probably will take the home as is as well. So it gives the seller incentive to purchase to them. So the investors and the, and the, um, and the corporations are really uh, what I would say were those barriers to allow others to achieve home ownership. And with an aging housing stock, Stephen, what exactly are buyers purchasing? S say that one, one more time. Yes, sir. With an aging housing stock, what uh -huh. exactly are buyers purchasing? Buyers are purchasing um, mainly single family homes under 300, under, under 320. Mm -hmm. um, but they're purchasing homes that are nine times out of 10 as is or homes that they have to go in and they have to do some work. So they're not always purchasing a home that's freshly painted. Mm -hmm. Or, or where you know the kitchen is updated or upgraded, um, or where you know they have, or, or honestly, I'll, I'll, I'll just just be real. There's some sellers that's not even leaving the house clean, like professionally clean at all. They are just literally taking their taking their things out and by and because it's so short, you know, the inventory is so sh short. There's not a lot of inventory at all. Buyers just have to pretty much accept it, right? Now, yes, we can negotiate certain things and negotiate that they do certain things. Right. But honestly, you know, you either want the house or you want them the two hundred dollars to complete, you know, for them to professionally clean it, right? Like, and it's things that buyers just have to give in to now that they used to ha didn't have to because again, the things have changed, right? Sellers are not asking you to come buy their house. You are asking them, can I buy your house? <laughs> that's the difference. That, that is, that's the difference. I know Charleston is growing, and there are a lot of old-timers out here who are worried about the future of the city and this tri-county. 
and you talk a lot about mindset. Where's gentrification in your mindset as a real estate agent and a broker? Gentrification is so, so, um, it's a, it's a large thing to tackle because gentrification is, it's a double edged sword. We need it in certain places because there's certain places that need to be revitalized, right? But we don't need it to a point where the people that lived in those areas are not able to afford to be able to repurchase those things, right? And so it's how it's done is what I think the biggest issue is. It's how it is really, and right now, there's really not a lot of regulation behind it, right? Because as long as they got the cash, and as long as the opportunity is there, they can purchase, right? Now, what what my biggest thing is, is why don't we have the community that's being, that we see the gentrification in, why aren't we just giving them resources in order to be able to do the same thing? Why aren't we providing funding to be able to revitalize that neighborhood? Why aren't we giving the opportunity to purchase the lot across the street, right? Or, or the lot next door or the lot, you know, down in, in our neighborhood so that we can keep it in-house and we can do what we want to do with it, right? We can create a community resource center of some sort or recreation center of some sort to keep the neighborhood, you know, thriving, right? We can we can put a, a, a convenience store here to make sure that we're giving back to our community, right? But nine times out of 10, we need the funding to be able to do those things. Now, one of the, one of the um, I will say probably one of the biggest barriers is being able to get that funding, mm -hmm. right? Because nine times out of 10, the people that are living in these gentrificated areas, they don't have the credit, income, or assets to be able to qualify for a, a commercial loan or, or even a higher purchase price home um, because that's not, they don't have the income, right? Or they don't have the assets. And, and maybe they're, and, and it's something that, Oh man, I wish that people would just, if you have a home and you know that the value is, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, even though it might not be in the great best shape, hold on to it. Don't give it up. And if you have to give it to somebody that's going to keep it in house, make sure that we give back to our own people, to our own neighborhood. Let's sell it to our next door neighbor's son. Or, or daughter or somebody that's going to keep it, you know, keep it in the neighborhood and not just give it to some corporation or some large, you know, some large investor that's going to come down here, tear everything down and create an opportunity for themselves to create their own generational wealth. Right. That's the part that we got to get to is where we don't allow these. To, and what's happening is um, people are losing these things, not only because they're selling them themselves. They're also losing them just due to tax, you know, tax liens. Right. A lot of people, a lot of investors and, you know, these corporations are just picking up tax liens. Yeah. It, and we're talking, you're losing a $300,000, $400,000 home because of $3,000 probably. Right? That is, and that's my point. We got to start getting funding for things like this so that this gentrification doesn't continue to happen. Because if we don't, it's gonna wipe. It's gonna wipe these neighborhoods out, and the neighborhoods, you know, that are out there now that were so historic, they won't be anymore, right? It'll be if you if you ride down North Charleston, there's some neighborhoods that do not look like they did even just ten years, ago, right? You ride down Rivers Avenue, it's different. You ride down, you know, Meter Street downtown, it's different yes. now, right? And so, and what they're doing is just one by one. It's just buying one prop one one property by one property, changing it, revitalizing it, and guess what it's doing to everybody else? Increasing the taxes. So you know, so and people like you know, corporations and investors like that, they got time to wait. They can wait because if they increase the taxes today, right? Maybe next year, grandma won't be able to afford it. So guess what? 
It's going to be a tax lien on it. And in two years, they're going to probably be able to acquire that property. That it's, it's so sad, but we gotta, we gotta, we gotta be intentional about it. That's the other piece. We gotta have enough people that are knowledgeable about that area, about what's going on, can't have the statistics. We gotta get to our, our, you know, our legislative leaders, right? To see what can be done to protect these areas. What, what, you know, maybe it's tax, tax relief. Maybe it's some kind of grant assistance funds. Maybe we need to actually go to those areas and find out what is the problem here? What are we lacking? You know, is it income? Is it education? Is it, is it, you know, investment vehicles? Because maybe they just don't know, right? People are selling to corporations and investors because they just don't know that they have another opportunity. They just don't know that they also don't know the value in what they already have. Maybe they don't know that their house is, you know, really worth 600,000, but an investor comes and shows them 300,000 and it's the most money that they've ever seen. So they take advantage of it, but not realizing that they really could sell for double. And if the money is the, is the issue, then go, come to a realtor, come to a brokerage that's going to help you get max and top dollar for it. So I would urge, you know, anybody, if they have those properties that are downtown or in gentrificated areas, you know, let a realtor do a, a market analysis to really validate, is that investor's offer, is it valid, right? This is where, you know, I always tell people, you should hire a realtor for every real estate transaction, commercial included, because we have the expertise and knowledge. We have the systems and resources to be able to pull up the data to show and to validate, hey, this is valid or this is not, right? And, and now we can lead you and educate you on, hey, this is what you're going to, you know, net proceeds. And then also, here's some things that you might be able to do with that, money, right? Here's another property that you might be able to invest in down the road. Here's what we can do. Like, let's develop a plan. Let's not just give it to them. And just allow them to do whatever they want to do with it and create all of these, again, all of these experiences and all of these things for other people when we can do the same for ourselves. I, I, I know you have to run, uh, but when you look at your market analysis, Stephen, what other areas in the Tri-County do you fear might be gentrified next? Well, um, North Charleston is... is is a big place, um, but it is absolutely, it's absolutely being gentrified. Um, I want to say Hanahan has gotten to the point where they are, even though it's small, right? They have it. It, it is changing. Um, that like Remont Road area, some of the avenue back there, it's right. changing. Um, they are they are definitely coming there. Um, another place that I, that I truly believe that's um. You know, we we know downtown for sure. Yeah. Uh, that, that I think that's just going to be a thing. Yeah. Uh, downtown for sure, North Charleston for sure. But there's portions of West Ashley uh, as well that I think, um, and, and although they're higher price points, it's still the same concept. It's mm -hmm. still the same thing. But I, I'll tell you, gentrification is coming everywhere where there is low low prop lower property taxes at the time now um any opportunity zones that are out there that's where it's coming first um and so you know that and that opportunity zone now goes from downtown up through north charleston um you know it does cover some of hand in hand and you know and i think those are those are the main places will it get to goose creek and you know all those places absolutely it it, it will at some point but it's just not there yet. Um, mm -hmm. I think most, and honestly, I think it's because most single family homes now are kind of coming up in those areas. You know, people are moving out because gentrification is pushing them out, right? And so as gentrification kind of centralizes around that downtown North Charleston area, like kind of right around Meeting Street where, where it is now, it's going to come up, but it's going to take some time to kind of get to, you know, the, the northern, northern sector. I really don't see it much in, you know, in like Somerville, Ridgeville, all those areas, it's not really there as much at all. 
as most people think it is. Um, it's really just actual homeowners trying to move out, <laughs> yeah. trying to get something that they can afford. Um, but the gentrification definitely is, is more centralized downtown than in that North Charleston area. And you're not worried about Arndale, McClellanville, or Hollywood, or Ravenel? So, I will say, so Ravenel, probably, um, at some point, I, I think it, it's starting to get there. But, but if you think about it, though, I, I don't really see it as gentrification. I see it as they're, connect, they're not connecting these places, right? Because people have to move out. So now they're, they're just connecting it all. So Ravenel doesn't seem as far because they're connecting it, right? So, and the same thing the, the other way in Mount Pleasant with Arlington, they're connecting these places. They're, they're connecting it to, to Mount Pleasant. So now, you know, they built that big hospital out there and so, off of 17, right? right? They built that for a reason. But the point is that they're connecting these areas. I don't really see those areas right now as gentrification just because, you know, people and, and you know, corporations are going out that way. I think there's, li there's literally no more land. So they have to spread out, right? They have to go to where these places are. Now, is that going to create some kind of uh, an increase in those areas? Absolutely. It's going to increase their taxes at some point, probably if we don't get legislators on board to protect those things, right? If we don't, and, and one of the things we need to do is make sure we're going into those areas and making sure that the elderly has, if they ha are eligible for a homestead tax exemption, they already have that. Right. So that they can be protected. So, again, I think, yes, it's going to expand out to those areas. But right now, probably not. It's, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time. Stephen Kahn, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome to Quintin's Close Ups. Yes. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, keep doing what you're doing, man. I'm proud of you, man. Thank you so much. Thank you.